So today is about uh, me talking about uh, Dalton's Law, okay? And um, there's one way to look at it, which is really easy relationship, and there's another way that people will not look at Dalton's Law and tend to get some uh, things wrong. So it's really important to um, dive in and understand what the real meaning of Dalton's Law is. Okay, so where does it begin? Well, it begins with the Avogadro hypothesis. It's the way that we actually got partly got, well, mainly got our mole theory from, okay? Uh, and we talked about this at length, but let's revisit this relationship. So volume is proportionate to moles, okay? And we know that if you have more gas particles, that's what N equals, it's gonna occupy more space. Everyone here has blown up a balloon. As you put more gas particles in the balloon, it expands because gases take space. Why do they take space? because gases are moving hundreds of miles an hour and bouncing off each other and the container walls to create that space. Okay, now how much space do gases take up or volume? Okay, well that depends upon the current temperature and the current pressure the container is on. That we've talked about this. So if you know the temperature and pressure, you can actually solve that volume is equal to mole times some constant that reflects those two values. We've been through this in our derivation. But this is Avogadro's hypothesis, or his relationship, that volume is proportionate to moles. Why does that work? Well, because volume is proportionate or equal to pressure as well. If you add more gas molecules, they're gonna bounce off their container more and require more space. That's how it all works. So this is really, really important. So the volume of gas or the space a gas takes up has to be proportionate to how many particles are in that container if that container is, is uh, you know, expandable, non-rigid. And it has to be also proportionate to the individual gases that are in that container if there's a mixture. So let's talk about a mixture because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. And we know something about this already, okay? Who cares what the gas is? If it occupies 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure, we have to define those conditions. We said that space is equivalent to a mole of gas particles, no matter what the gas particles are. So I don't care what the gases are. If they're under the same temperature and pressure, they occupy the same space. That's really important, which means if I've got a mixture of gases in a container, hey, if it's in a container, it's in the same space, it has to have the same temperature and pressure if it's in the same space, then the two or more different gases in that mixture are acting alike, okay? So let me give you that idea here. So let's take a uh, container, and the simplest way to do it is to draw some particles of A. Hey, I know they're not this big, but I will draw them anyway. And then we have some particles of B. Okay, now the way that I drew this is I have a mixture of two gases. Because they're in the same container, they have to be under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. So all of these gases, although they're different, are acting the same. What does that mean? Well. They're all are contributing to the total pressure. What's pressure? It's the force of collisions in this container. So if I look at this the way that I drew this, it should make sense to you that the total pressure in here, PT, is equal to the total amount of collisions. The total collisions. Each collision has a force over an area. So the total pressure, the total collisions of, of what? Of all gases, of A and B. Okay, now, this should be understandable for you. Since I drew them so that there are three particles of B and three particles of A, we can clearly see based upon my example that half of the total collisions are due to A, and half of the total collisions are due to B. Therefore, of the total number of collisions, which of course is the what? 
relates to the total number of pressure, we can clearly see, I hopefully can make this jump, that half of the total pressure in this container is due to what? Half of each of the gases. Or we can say that the individual pressures that each of these gases exert equals the total. Okay? So I can say that the total pressure is due to the what? The collisions of A plus the collisions of B. And the collisions that B makes, based upon my example, have to be half of that of B. When you collect all of the collisions, we get the total pressure. So what does this equal? Well, pressure total is equal to the partial pressure of A. When I say partial pressure, it just means that in a container, in an area, okay, that represents the pressure made or responsible from A. The collisions of A are responsible for a certain pressure. So when I say partial pressure of gas A or hydrogen or last night's homework was water vapor, then I'm saying partial pressure means, hey, that's the pressure responsible for the particles of this gas colliding. They're responsible for half. Why? Because half of the particles in the container are A and B. That should make sense to you. So the pressure that's created by the collisions of A plus the pressure, partial pressure if you want to be exact, of B is what? All the collisions that B exerts in this container over an area, which is pressure. So the total pressure is equal to the pressure that results from A colliding plus the pressure that B collides. Because there's equal number of gas particles, there is equal pressure. So we'd say the partial pressure of A and B is half that, or the partial pressure of A is half that of the total pressure. That makes sense? Has to be. Part pressure is due to collisions. Collisions are due to particles. So the number of particles, okay, represents a connection to the pressure. Since these particles are even, there's 50% what? 50% gas A and 50% gas B in terms of molecules, then the partial pressure should be equal to these, and each one, okay, equals the total. So if there was a 100 torr, of pressure in this container, what would be the partial pressure of A? 50. 50 torr. And that of what? B is also 50 torr. Now that seems pretty darn simple. People love to speak of Dalton's law as the individual partials of the gases in a container equal the total. And that does not reflect everything you have to understand. That, of course, is easy. But why? The why is, is the percentage of the moles gives you a percentage of the collisions, which is really the what? Percentage of the pressure, which is also a percentage of the volume. So what's proportionate here? Okay. How much space? If I was to take out B, let's say that this container was not rigid. Let's say this container, okay, could, could change. Can anyone guess? If I was to take out B, it would be some space. yeah, and if by how much? Exactly. If I take out half the gas molecules, wouldn't the volume go down by 50%? And why is that? Because it's a what? A direct proportion. So we say that the volume. Okay, let's say this is a 10 liter container when I have B. So we could say that, oh, A is taking up how many liters in this container? Five. And we'll say that B is taking up how many? Five. What's proportionate? Moles are proportionate, which must be pressure is proportionate, and so is volume. You, that's... Dalton's law. 
pressure is proportionate because particles are responsible for the collisions, okay? Space it takes up, hey, if it's twice the space, it must have twice the number of molecules. So volume, moles, and pressure are all proportionate to the particles of the gas in here. Really what you're saying is A and B, yes, they're different particles, but they're acting the same. They're acting the same. Now, there's no difference because they're under the same what? Temperature and pressure. That is truly Dalton's law. And I'm gonna show you that by one of the problems of the homework. Let's go there. So if we go to the homework, keeping the understanding that volume, moles, and um, pressure are proportionate to gases in a mixture, this should help, okay? And I think I have a little thing here going here. Cancel this. Okay, so let's continue to the work of home. But I hope you did, because, uh, because I didn't have a form associated with it, I, I get scared about people who don't do the homework that I assign. Okay, and then all of a sudden, I don't understand anything. Okay, so maybe I can scroll up. Okay, so let's go to the top. Now, I know that I, this, this key is probably 10, 15 years old, and, and every time I look at problems that I do, I, I find different ways to explain it. And I know I had a video with this, so I'm probably gonna, probably gonna explain this a little differently, okay? But let's do this problem, okay? Again, and with the understanding that again, who's proportionate in Dalton's law? Dalton's law comes from the Avogadro's hypothesis, an application. Same temperature and pressure, hey, volume is proportionate to number of moles. Number of moles, is proportionate to the individual pressures. More particles, more collisions. Okay, so in this question, we have a container. Okay, in this container, three liters is hydrogen. So three liters is hydrogen gas. Okay, two liters is CO2. And we have chlorine gas is also in the mixture, but we do not know its volume, okay? That's the whole part of the problem. Now, notice something. <clears throat> in this mixture, I have hydrogen, CO2, and chlorine. I drew dividing lines here to make it simplified in my brain. There's no dividing lines. We, when we put hydrogen, uh, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, and chlorine in the container, they're not what? They're not social distancing, okay? They're gonna mix. Okay, it's gonna be a super spreader event in here. They're gonna mix evenly. What I'm showing you that if this was a collapsible or a non-rigid container, if I take out the two gases under the same conditions, hydrogen would what, only occupy three liters. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so giving you these boxes here give you those proportionates of volume, what they would be if the other gases weren't there. Okay, that's why, that's why I draw it like that. So understand that. Okay, so the first thing they said was, okay, the entire flask is at STP. That's an important piece of information. STP is standard temperature and pressure. And the reason why we have STP in gas laws is because gases can have any volume, can't they? I can have a, I can have a volume that's big or small depending if I change temperature, pressure, number of particles. So there's no finite volume for a gas. But if I fix the temperature, which means I'm, keeping them with, a, with a, uh, a, a fixed average kinetic energy, they don't go faster or slower, right? And I fix the pressure on the collapsible um, system, non-rigid container, okay? Then we have fixed volumes based upon what? Moles, remember, volume is equal to N times K, which is that fixed amount. Okay, enough said here. So how am I doing here? So STP, well, standard temperature is 273 Kelvin, or zero degree Celsius, which is given to you in your reference table, and standard pressure is 760 torr. It's also 14.7 pounds per square inch, 101.3 kilopascals, one atmosphere, 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury. We've been through this, but I'm using torr here. Why? Because they gave me torr values. Okay, they also said that CO2, the partial pressure, the pressure in this mixture, the individual pressure that CO2 is responsible for was 200 torr. So that's the setup. What's the volume of Cl2? Okay, this becomes very difficult if you do not understand that volume, moles, 
and pressures, partial pressures, are all proportionate to each other if you're in a mixture in the same temperature and pressure. Now watch. Okay, I don't know how I explained this in the video, but this is how I would think about it now. I want to solve for the liter. If I have a pressure fraction or a mole fraction, I can do it because they're all proportionate. But here's what I do. I want to find this pressure here. Now, what do I know? If I didn't have the other, other two gases, hydrogen is three liter. If I didn't have these two gases, CO2 is two liters. Oh, under the same conditions of temperature pressure. So if hydrogen would occupy more space, hey, more space, doesn't it have more moles? And therefore more pressure? Well, how much bigger is hydrogen than CO2? Isn't it 1.5 times bigger? And I could write that out mathematically, but what's 1.5 times two? Okay, good. So if this is 1.5 times bigger, what's 1.5 times 200? 300. How did I just do that? I just did that by saying volumes are proportionate to pressure. I use the proportionality, uh, and I, again, I could write this out, okay? But that's what I just did there. I use the idea. That, that, my friends, is what? That's Dalton's law. No one teaches you that. People say total pressure is equal to the partial. It's really that. That's the way you've got to see it. So I got 300 torr by saying, oh, the volume is 1.5 times. If I've got double the volume of one gas to the other, remember the boxes we filled out in Gay-Lussac's law of combining volumes? Remember that you had two boxes of hydrogen, one box of oxygen gives you two boxes of water vapor? This is the same thing here, same idea. Two boxes of hydrogen because you had twice the particles of hydrogen, okay? So, so any case, good. Now, because I know 760 is the total pressure, I add these together, 500. 760 minus 500, and that gives me what? 260. So I know that this is 260 torr. Now you say, well, why do I want that? Because I want the volume. Now, look, here's how I would solve for it. Now, many people can do this differently. I'm sure there's many ways to do this, but I want you to think in terms of what's proportionate, okay? I want to find, last night you guys did mole fractions, okay? I want to find a volume fraction. Okay, so there's yeah, many ways. I'm just gonna do it one way to show you. Probably not the way you want to do it, but in any case, you got, some of you guys are smarter than me. So I know the total, um, I'm, I'm gonna find a pressure fraction. So the total pressure is 760. Now, I'm gonna solve for the pressure fraction of these guys. Okay, so that's 500. So add these together. 500 torr. And the reason I'm doing that is, okay, so 500 over 260, you put that in your calculator, 0. 0.66. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Okay. Thank you for correcting that. Yeah, it's 0. 0.66. Okay. Now, that being said, now that we know it's 0. 0.66, okay, let's go on. What does that mean? I have a pressure fraction. This means that these two gases are responsible for 66% of all the collisions. What is proportionate? Pressure, volume, and what? Moles. This is a pressure fraction, but it's also a mole fraction. It's the same thing, right? The pressure, the reason why this is 66% of the pressure because 66% 60, of the particles are these gases, correct? Correct. So a pressure fraction is a mole fraction, which is also a what? A volume. volume fraction. So this is a volume fraction, which means 0.66, okay? If I have the total what? I don't know the total volume, do I? So total volume, but what's responsible for these guys? Five liters over some liters, okay? So solve for that, X of course becomes five liters over 0.66, you do that, you get approximately 7.6 liters. What I just solved for? I found the total liters by making a pressure fraction become a volume fraction. A pressure fraction became a volume because they're exactly proportionate based upon what I'm saying. Now that I know the total what? Liters is 7.6, okay? And these guys are five liters. Okay, what do I do? 
subtract, okay, 7.6 the total, subtract, okay, 5 liters, and you get approximately 2 point, uh, sorry, 7.6, and you get 2.6 liters or so, all right? Okay, it may not be the exact way that you solve for it, but I was able to leap from a pressure to a volume and do these types of calculations in my head or make these relationships because of that. That is the essence of Dalton's Law, okay? All right, now, let's move on to uh, some classic robotic type of problems. I call them robotic because these are the classic uh, problems you see in textbooks of Dalton's Law. Hey, I've got a mixture of gases in a container. I have this many grams of, of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia based on our last slide. You can see how they may have gotten those grams. Okay, we uh, know the total pressure, okay, to be 2.35 atmospheres. I can't use mass ratios. I have to convert my how many, how heavy number into a how many, so I convert to moles. Then I find a mole fraction, add up the total moles, and put the part over total, that is a mole fraction, which is a pressure fraction, which is a volume fraction, the same thing. So take that fraction, times it by the total, and you get the part it's responsible for very straightforward, okay? But we're using a mole fraction. But I could, make, I could get a mole fraction by a, by a uh, volume fraction, okay? So again, having, not difficult, without seeing those relationships, you could get stuff wrong. Your homework tonight is an advanced AP problem that when people, when people did it, they either got it right away or they couldn't do it. And so if you understand these relationships this way, I believe that'll help you navigate any, any type of, of this type of problem or these types of uh, complicated problems. This is straightforward. This is, I call this robotic because people will teach this. Convert the moles, find the mole fraction, times it by the total. People will teach it that way. And then if you get something maybe like this, where you need to understand the relationships, you're stuck in the mud, okay? Understand, this is more robotic, okay? But you still have people to understand this one too. You go to college, you'll see that, for sure, okay? Now, what about this one? This one relates to the lab that we're gonna start tomorrow, okay, for you guys Friday. What we're gonna do is collect a gas over water. It's called a, a water displacement. So let me explain this procedure. And this introduces a new variable to the system or to this gas. So, here's what we're gonna do we're going to collect a gas over water. It's called by water displacement. And let me explain the process, a very, very classic way to collect gas. Okay, for instance, um, we're going to take a container, and it's going to be filled with water. Room temperature water. I think that's, it might be purple, but hey, we have purple water. Okay, now, I'm going to have a tube. And tubes that we use to measure volumes of gas called eudiometer tubes. We're going to fill that with water, or in this case, purple water. Is that purple or blue? I don't know. Purple. Okay, whatever. Okay. We're going to put a thumb over it. We're going to invert it and stick it under and then support it by a clamp. So we're going to have this eudiometer tube. I don't know why I have waves. It's a wavy day, I guess, in our water bath. We're going to have this tube. Okay. Oh, I was nervous drawing that. All right, and of course, atmospheric pressure can support up to 33 feet of water, so water won't come down, right? Atmospheric pressure is gonna keep that water up. Now, what we do is the following. We can, we can generate some gas, okay? For instance, this could be an Erlenmeyer flask with a stopper, one hole stopper that I connect some aquarium tubing. So when I generate a gas, I can put that tubing there. Um, I could add some zinc. I could add hydrochloric acid. And we should know what happens here. The H pluses that come off the strong acid rip electrons away from zinc. We make hydrogen gas. And we make zinc chloride solution as well. Okay, and of course that has to be balanced. All right, now, so we're gonna make hydrogen gas. We know that H pluses are strong enough oxidizing agents to make that happen. And so we're gonna make hydrogen gas. So if I drop, hydrochloric acid onto the zinc, we're gonna bubble hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is less dense than the liquid, so it's gonna rise. When it rises, it starts collecting on the top. 
and the gases in this part of the container push the water out. We displace the water by the air pressure in the top of that tube. Okay, that's why they call it water displacement. And udiometer tubes are like your burettes. They're emptying devices. So they're marked up here as one, two, three, four, and there's calibrations in between. And we can actually measure the volume of the gas, okay, by how much space was created by water displacement. Kind of cool. And if you know the pressure of the day, right, the pressure pushing down, you know the temperature of the system, you know your volume, you can solve for moles. Hey, that's how we do it. And then you're off and running, convert to grams, you can do your stoichiometry. But there is a problem in this system. Number one, if the gas that you're making or collecting dissolves in water, water's polar. So if you have a polar gas, it can dissolve in the water. And you can see that you're gonna have a what? You have an underrepresented volume there. Not all the gas will get here. That won't be a good use of water displacement. You can't have a gas that's polar, okay, because it will dissolve some water. And two, what if the gas reacts with water? Okay, obviously not all the gas is gonna get up here, it's gonna react with the water. So you have to have a gas that doesn't react with water and not soluble in water, okay? And hydrogen's not, so it's a great use there. Now, there's another issue besides that flaw, is that when we measure the volume, volume is proportionate to moles to pressure, correct? Okay, the problem is, anytime we collect a gas over water, we're also collecting water vapor. Little amounts of water, not a lot, but water is continually evaporating. Even on a cold day, even on a cold day, puddles evaporate, correct? So even colder room temperature water is gonna have some evaporation. So some of this gas in here, not much, is also water in the gas phase. Think with me for a second. If I'm measuring the volume and I have H2 gas, hydrogen, and water vapor, isn't my volume gonna be greater than it's supposed to be? What's volume? Isn't volume proportionate to moles? If I have more moles of gas by the, by the evaporation of water, isn't my volume gonna be overestimated and mess up my calculations? So what we have to do to figure out either the pressure in here or the volume, we have to correct it. And what we do is we know separately that water evaporates at different temperatures and creates something called vapor pressure. The word vapor pressure is the force due to liquids evaporating. So anytime we collect a gas over liquid, we're also collecting water gas. So in here, guess what? You have a mixture of gases. So in this problem here, they tell you the total pressure in my system is uh, 1.56 atmospheres. They have the moles of the gases, but they collect it over water. So this pressure in this top part of the tube is inflated because there's also water vapor in there. So you go to a table, you read the temperature of your system, that'll tell you the pressure of the water in there. So we're gonna have to subtract away that what? That water pressure to get the total pressure. And that's all you do there with those labs. So what we do here is I, I convert my tour into atmospheres. So this is the pressure due to water evaporating at that temperature, 4 degrees Celsius is pretty warm, okay? And I can't just take the total pressure times the mole fractions. I've gotta subtract out the water to get the new total pressure that's just due to those three gases and everything else is the same. I know I wrote it kind of weird down here, but um, I just broke it up. Notice I have the what? Moles, over, part moles over total. So this really here is the mole fraction times the total. But the total pressure, I reduced it because I took away the water pressure, okay? And if I wanted to find the new volume of the dry gas, the fraction of the pressure would be the fraction of the volume. I could find the new corrected volume as well, all right? So that's, an extra step. Anytime you collect over water, you have to subtract out the water vapor, okay? All right, so I wanna continue on really quickly with some applications of Dalton's Law because I don't wanna teach you from a worksheet. I wanna show you how this stuff, real life has applications. So 
Uh, let's make this big, up close and personal. Okay, so we have diving gears. When we go into water, we want to breathe. Now, these tanks are heavy. They're heavy because we have up to 235 atmospheres of pressure in them. Why? Because I want to stuff a lot of air in a small space so I can what? Have a lot of air with me. If I take a, by the way, I think these things are about like two liters in here. If I took a bag of two liters of air and I wanted to breathe, how long do you think it's gonna last you? Yeah, not very much, because uh, two liters of air. But if I take two liters of air and compress it to 235, I've got a lot of air I can breathe. So we have to have these heavy, thick wall tanks that give us a lot of air in a small volume. That's why they're heavy. And the reason why they're heavy is they're thick wall. Why are they thick wall? Because gas under that pressure is really, really, really dangerous. And it would break through any small uh, you know, uh, walled system. Think about an aerosol can. An aerosol can's explode at probably like 1.7 atmospheres. That's why you should not throw one on a fire because you get fragments. But these, but these won't, okay, oh, they can explode, but under these pressures they can exist and keep that entire amount of what force over area from, from the gas escaping. Now, these tanks that we worked with to figure out helium and argon yesterday, they're heavy because they're thick walled. Okay, heavy. You can think of it's cast iron right here. Okay. Now, OSHA requirements is that when you have these tanks, by the way, this one is empty. Okay. Okay, so there's no more of this gas in here. But if you have 235 atmospheres of pressure, the reason why OSHA requires us to have these guys uh, on a wall and chained up is that if this was to fall, so if this was to fall, and this was to hit the ground and break under 235 the atmosphere, what do you think is going to happen? You, it'll, it'll take off like a rocket. What do you think a torpedo is? Okay, same idea. All right, so again, these are, this one's empty. Uh, but in any case, let's continue on. So the first thing is you've got gases under high pressure. Now, if I was to open up a tank under 235 atmospheres and try to breathe that, I would explode my lungs. My lungs can't handle that pressure coming out. It'd rupture my lungs, so it wouldn't work out. So we have a regulator. Anyone, anyone out here a scuba dive? All right, cool. So this regulator takes the, takes, takes the high pressure and regulates it down to the pressure you're under. So if you're under 33 foot of water, we now know that's two atmospheres of pressure. This air now you're breathing is now two atmospheres. Okay, now, that's important. Now, what do we know? We learned already that one atmosphere of pressure at sea level, if you're under 33 feet, that's equivalent to one atmosphere of pressure, so your body's gonna feel two atmospheres. What happens to the volume? It's halved, okay? If you undergo um, 66 feet, it's another atmosphere of pressure, and you can see what's happening to the volume of the gas that's in your lungs. As you get deeper and deeper, the air in your lung gets what? Compressed. Okay, let me explain how we breathe. This is an example of how we breathe. We have one lung here. We have our air tube, right, a trachea, okay? And bronchi into alveoli, this little air sacs, but the same idea. This is the thoracic cavity, which is protected by our what? Rib cage. It's sealed. Our thoracic cavity has to be sealed because it works by Boyle's law. This is the diaphragm. We have air outside and air, in, and air inside this con container outside the lungs. Now watch. If I want to actively draw air in, your diaphragm goes down. What happens? Diaphragm goes down. What happens? Right. Your lungs expand. So when you take a breath in, you're not forcing air in. You have nothing to do with it. All you're doing is having your diaphragm come down like this. Make the space bigger. If volume goes up, what happens to pressure in this space? If I make the space bigger for the same number of particles at the same temperature, what happens? The pressure drops. My friends, another example. Volume is equal to one over P times a constant. What's the constant related to? Keeping the moles constant 
and the temperature constant. That's Boyle's law. So you draw air in by lowering the pressure. Okay? And of course, a punctured lung would be that you, you've done what? Punctured lung sometimes doesn't mean that you punctured the lung. It just means that you punctured a hole in your thoracic cavity. So I put a hole here. When I do this, air rushes in from the side, not here, and your lung doesn't open up. They say it's collapsed sometimes. So that's why this has to stay constant, because N has to stay constant. Now, think with me for a second. If I'm under high pressure, if I'm under 66 feet of water, I'm feeling in the regulator three atmospheres of gas coming out, correct? Is this important? So this system is under three atmospheres of pressure. This is what you're breathing in, and that's what the air is here. How do we do? How does this work? We create a partial vacuum by making the space bigger, right? We lower the pressure so the higher pressure rushes in. If we're in a high pressure scenario, I can't lower the pressure enough for the air to rush in. And you can't breathe that way if you're breathing one atmosphere of air. Now, I, I tell you this story because I'm always interested. I go in my pool. I don't suggest you do this, but I make a straw. And I put a straw into a straw. The straw was less than two feet. I tried to breathe under two feet of water, and I couldn't. I, I couldn't grab it. So just being under one atmosphere of pressure and two feet of water, the pressure that my lungs are under was so high, my diaphragm couldn't create enough space to lower the pressure enough for the air to rush in. And I couldn't breathe. And there's a famous story of, I don't know if it's a legion, but a group of Roman soldiers that wanted to attack some city. They took these reeds, I don't know, so far along, and they had their armor on. And they all, they didn't test this, okay? That's why science is important. You should do an experiment before, right? And they all, I don't know how many, walked into the water with their gear on to breathe. They wanted to attack these guys under the bridge or whatever it would be, in a motor somewhere. So a group of Roman soldiers with their gear on went underwater to breathe what? To breathe the air. And they were under, not 33 feet, but what happened? Because their lungs, thoracic cavity, was under high pressure due to the weight of the water and the air, the diaphragm couldn't create enough space to lower it enough to bring atmospheric air in. Think about it. I have regular pressure here. My thoracic cavity is under high pressure. I can't lower it enough if this gets higher. So they couldn't breathe, and they all drowned. And besides that, they couldn't swim up because they were all their armor on. Okay? I don't know. There's a, supposedly, that's a true scenario. So it's kind of interesting. All right? All right. Let's take a break, please. All right? But... What is air made up of? It's made up of mostly nitrogen. I round to 80%. A lot of people, people round this to 20, but 21%, 78, uh, one, about 1% 1 argon and some trace elements, okay? And look at this for a second. This is a really cool part here. Okay, here's a mixture, four atmospheres total, okay, of gases. Hey, gas A is one atmosphere of pressure, and gas B is three. Oh, this has three times the number of particles. Of course it does. That's why it has what? 70% more gas, which means that it has what? What's the partial pressures? If, now, so partial pressure is one atmosphere, three atmospheres. This has three times the amount of particles. Okay, therefore it has three times the what? Individual partial pressure that relates to the total. Now let's compress this to eight atmospheres, meaning let's go under a lot of water. Okay, now, what happens? Total pressure now becomes eight. Hey, if I do what? Compress it, if compressed to, to eight atmospheres, that means I what? Have the volume. Now, if I increase the total pressure because I'm deeper in water, total pressure is now greater, correct? What's the ratio? Still three to one, but what happened to the partial pressure? Yes, that's important when we're mixing gases. So we used to take compressed air, compressed air in our, in our scuba gear that was still what? 80% or so, 78% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Our body has evolved by using 20% oxygen. Now 20% oxygen, if you do atmospheres, is about 0.2 atmospheres. So the partial pressure of oxygen that we evolved to use efficiently is 0.2 atmospheres. 
So think with me for a second. If we use compressed air, let's pretend it's 20% oxygen. 20% of one atmosphere is 0.2, correct? So our bodies are used to 0.2 atmospheres of partial pressure to breathe in to, to be an efficient molecule. We've been doing this since we've been alive. Now, if we take compressed air, so there it is. So there is the, our partial pressure in atmospheres that we're used to breathing normally, that we're very successful because we're still here. If I go under the water with the same ratio of nitrogen to oxygen, it's called compressed air, look what happens. If we used air at one atmosphere and compressed it to 10 atmospheres, because we want more, we want more what? We want more gas to breathe in. So take air, compress it, that's what we used to do. When we breathe it, let's pretend at 10 atmospheres, what are we getting? What's the partial pressure of that air coming out now? If we're under the regulator of 10 atmospheres. Two atmospheres. What are we used to? Point two. Acute toxicity, that means we could die by too much oxygen, occurs at 0.4 atmospheres of, of pressure. So people were taking compressed air, going down deeply, and what was happening is they were coming up with it and becoming very sick and sometimes dying because they were breathing in a much larger partial pressure. So when you compress air, they have to lower the percentage of oxygen, and that's why they have to rate the tanks at certain depths. If you're gonna be diving at a certain depth, you have a certain tank that has a certain percentage so that when you breathe in, it comes out to about 0.2. You don't wanna breathe in more. So you can't take compressed air, and there's another problem with that. Okay, and so here are the cute twitching of, of small muscles in the hand is fa facial pallor, cotton breathing, <laughs> exposure, get vertigo, nausea, followed by altered behavior, clumness, and finally convulsions. Imagine being underwater with vertigo. Okay, people have died because of just taking compressed air. Kind of cool. That, that's not cool though. Okay, <laughs> acute. Sick. Now, wait a minute. Sick. If you have too much nitrogen, you get the creeps, the chokes, pain in the chest extreme feed and also death. Okay, one more thing. Brooklyn Bridge, stay with me. The Brooklyn Bridge was built by taking something called casoms. These are enormous stone towers we still see today. To affix them, they had to dig them into the bedrock under the river, under the East River. So people had to, they made boxes and they put people, they, they put a box pumped out the water, people got in the box, and they pumped in air. They're under that much water. They were breathing in what kind of partial pressure of oxygen? Much, much higher. They were also breathing in a lot of nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is soluble in higher pressures. When they came up to the surface, the nitrogen bubbled out. That bubbling collected in their joints, and that's what gives you something called the bends. They can't straighten up. If that bubbling occurs in your blood vessel, that could stop blood flow. You could have a heart attack, aneurysm, stroke, and death. Okay, so a lot of these guys suffered from what we call the bends. So what do they do? They lower the oxygen, and they take out the nitrogen. In fact, a lot of the mixtures now have helium as a, it replaced with nitrogen, because nitrogen is soluble in bloodstream, but then will come out as a gas as you raise them. So Decompression is a way to what? Go from high pressure to low so that you don't form the bubbles, okay? I'll see you guys tomorrow. The designer of the bridge, the architect or the engineer used to go down in there to examine the work there because the whole bridge was based upon that. He died from the bends. Yeah. When you ride over the Brooklyn Bridge, I always think about that. <laughs>